This is Montevideo, the capital and largest city of Uruguay. It's not just the largest metro area, it's home to 56% of the nation's population. It's also 19 times larger than the next largest city, Salto. It's clear that Montevideo is the economic and cultural center of Uruguay, something urban geographers call a primate city. Montevideo is just one such city on this planet. Ulaanbaatar is 43% of Mongolia's population and 15 times larger than the country's next largest city. San Jose is 42% of Costa Rica's population and 37 times larger than the country's next largest city. Reykjavik is 54% of Iceland's population and 12 times larger than that country's next largest city. You get the idea. Across continents, there are countries that are often defined by its major city. Why do some countries have these primate cities while others like the US, Australia, India, Canada, the Netherlands, and China do not? And are these primate cities better than the rest? Let's answer those questions after the bike bell. This video is sort of an opposite of the geography videos you may have seen on YouTube. The ones that ask you, why does nobody live here? I think that's a really clever framing to talk about human geography, but I can't help thinking about the opposite question. Why does seemingly everyone in some countries live in the capital city? Why not spread out more evenly? I'm definitely not the first person to ask this question. The first person to ask this question and then write about it was a geographer named Mark Jefferson. He was teaching at Eastern Michigan University in Ypsilanti and started publishing papers on cities, his first in 1907. He would make a career out of trying to understand the relationship between people, cities, and economies, but perhaps his most impactful paper was called The Law of the Primate City. He wondered why some countries had cities that dwarfed all other cities in its boundaries. The question percolated throughout his career. He spent much of his time traveling around the world in an era before the internet and access to reliable, comparable population statistics. He had to gather them as he traveled and later call cities one by one to assemble the data for his journal article. There was no UN population statistics to refer to because there was no UN back then. He reported his population statistics in a unique way. Let's look at Austria, the most extreme example he found back in 1939. For each country, the primate city was given the number 100 which in this case was Vienna. The next two largest cities were given numbers corresponding to their percentage of their population relative to the primate city. So Graz is eight and Linz is six. They were only 8% and 6% of the population of Vienna respectively. In this way, every nation's primate city metric could be reported as those three numbers. Denmark at the time was second with a score of 111.9. Hungary was next with 113.12. And the UK was fourth with 114.13. Unsurprisingly for the era, Europe got a lot of coverage in his analysis, but he did calculations for Asian nations like China, which was more evenly distributed with 144.37. Japan was also flatter with 151.16. India clocked in with a very flat 179.44. For my US audience, it was also pretty flat back then with 143.27, though interestingly, the three largest cities at the time were New York, Chicago, and Philly. Once Jefferson had this information, he wanted to know why some countries had primate cities while others like India and the US did not, at least not at the extreme of Austria and Denmark. Here he doesn't really provide a satisfying hypothesis. He mentions nationalism in nations, which does make some sense. If you're an ambitious kid born in rural Austria, you're gonna try to make your fortune in Vienna. You're not gonna try to move to London. There's no friction in you moving to Vienna, whereas you have to immigrate to the UK to move to London. Countries with significant rural to urban migration that have cities that act as major cultural and economic magnets generate primate cities. Now, this is a little bit simplistic, which of course means that his paper has inspired geographers for generations to improve upon his data and propose new hypotheses. We'll get to those in a second. Jefferson was also interested in countries that had no primate city at all. Why was that the case? He brings up two examples, Spain and Italy. He believes Spain to be two countries stuck together, the Castilian side with Madrid and the Catalan side with Barcelona. Each city would attract their own rural migrants, hence the 191-31 split. Italy is sort of the same story. The country only fully reunified in 1870, only 69 years before the paper was published. Prior to reunification, it was several different kingdoms with their own capitals and economies. That's why in 1939, their primate number was 196-75, the least primate country he analyzed. Okay, so that was 1939. What about today? Now we have much better statistics and we're able to look at all countries, not just the 50 that that one geographer wanted to look at. These days, urban geographers don't use the same 100 number number split Jefferson used. There are various ways to calculate primacy, but a basic one takes the largest city population and divides it by the combined population of the next two largest cities. That gives us one clean number, making direct comparisons easier to do. 
There's actually an even easier way, which is just to create a ratio between the population of the most populous city and the second most populous city. No need to calculate a third city. This is how Wikipedia does it, and while it's probably not as good as the three city model, I'm going to use it so everyone watching can go and see their country's primate number on the Wikipedia page for primate cities. It beats me trying to calculate and report every single country in this video. You might be thinking that Wikipedia probably doesn't have the best data on city populations, and you'd be right, but the dirty secret of urban geography is that it's actually really hard to compare cities across nations because every nation does it differently. One of the best websites for getting urban population data is citypopulation.de. I recommend checking it out. But the webmaster even says that population statistics are all of varying and some of suspect accuracy. So let's just use Wikipedia and move on with our lives, all right? Sri Lanka has the most distinct primate city, with Colombo being 45 times larger than the next largest city, Kandy. Costa Rica is second, with San Jose being 37 times larger than Puerto Limon. Barbados is essentially tied, with a primate number of 37 as well. What do these cities have in common? Well, first of all, they're small. Barbados is one-third the size of the five boroughs of New York. It's easier for small countries to develop a primate city, as there's unlikely to be a second location appropriate for a major city, nor an economy that could support a second major city. Large countries like Russia, Canada, the US, Brazil, and China have some of the lowest scores. A 2009 study found a few additional commonalities some countries with primate cities share. One category identified is middle-income Latin American countries with a colonial past. They identify Argentina, Chile, Cuba, Costa Rica, Haiti, Jamaica, Nicaragua, Suriname, Uruguay, and Peru. There are actually others in this range on the Wikipedia list, but this study used a three-city calculation and it's from 2009. Things change. Urban primacy was initiated and enforced by colonizers who used the major cities as logistical hubs for transporting goods back to Europe. The administrative capital was located in the same city, as were all the local elites. After independence, local elites maintained the status of the primate city. Urban primacy was the physical embodiment of consolidated power and wealth, whereas the rural countryside was poor and powerless. Latin American primacy has decreased over time as this dynamic has eased somewhat. Argentina, Peru, and Uruguay saw declines in their primate numbers. Colombia is an example of a country without a primate city. Bogota is still the biggest, most important city, but Medellin is large and growing as well. Primate cities are common on the African continent, historically due to colonialism in much the same way as Latin America. The trends here are more mixed, however. Urbanization is happening rapidly across the entire continent, and Africa will soon be home to many of the world's largest cities. In some countries, like Nigeria, that will only increase primacy there, while in countries with multiple large cities, their primate numbers will go down. Moving over to Europe, Armenia, Georgia, Latvia, and Serbia are considered newer primates, as they were once part of the former USSR and Yugoslavia. Now separate independent entities, their principal cities are now primate cities. There are some old primates out there too, like Budapest for Hungary and Vienna for Austria, still big from their histories as centers of old empires. Primacy can also exist within subnational divisions. For example, Colorado has a primate number of 3.9 because the Denver metro area is so much bigger than the Colorado Springs metro area. States with high primate numbers may be dominated politically by those cities. For example, it's pretty common to hear residents of rural Illinois complain about Chicago's influence on the state's affairs. The journal article I've been using for this section of the video is called Urban Primacy, Reopening the Debate, which is a great title, and also points to the lack of consensus on this topic. It's not easy to draw causal connections between economic growth and population growth, as well as migration patterns. You might be able to tell a compelling story for one country or a group of similar countries, but that theory doesn't work worldwide. I'd also like to point out that understanding primate cities doesn't really do much for city planners working on the ground in those cities. It may be important to understand local economic growth and rural-urban migration patterns, but primate city theory isn't really useful for predicting trends or shaping policy. What I think it is useful for is guiding our thinking about the role cities play in the economic and cultural lives of the people within nations. Cities generate wealth and culture, and that concentration of wealth and culture can be good, but it can also promote inequities. So the answer to the question, why does everyone live here, is it's complicated. It's fun thinking about the flows and concentrations of humans on this planet, but it's critical that we think about the flows and concentrations of wildlife on this planet too, because right now, those flows are breaking down and we're running out of time to fix it. That's why I'm a Planet Wild member, and why I think you should consider becoming one too. Planet Wild has this really cool model for nature protection. Every month, they partner with a conservation organization to complete a specific conservation project. We as a community contribute to Planet Wild monthly or yearly, and our contributions fund that project. Simple, right? 
And the coolest thing is that you get to stay connected to the project because Planet Wild creates YouTube videos and reports that tell you exactly what they helped achieve. When you join Planet Wild, you'll be met with so many different projects that Planet Wild is engaged in, and some of them are just amazing. I'm a big fan of fungi, and I was excited to see that Planet Wild is supporting an effort by the Fungi Foundation to have the United Nations recognize fungi and alongside get flora fungi and fauna officially recognized and, and protected again in by the UN Convention on. This project is great because it's not just about preserving habitat for a big photogenic mammal, but creating policy change for an overlooked branch in nature. And you would think that a video from Planet Wild about fungi on YouTube would be less exciting than something with like lions or whales in them, but you'd be wrong because it was a really high quality, engaging video filled with interesting information. If you watch it, you'll be learning things about fungi that you never knew that you needed to know. If fungi isn't your thing, they have so many other projects, things like rewilding power line corridors in Switzerland and creating an underground sculpture garden in the Mediterranean to stop trawlers from overfishing with their nets. I don't know, I guess I'm really attracted to the projects that focus on the relationship between humans and nature and have creative policy and design responses. Honestly, my mission with City Beautiful is to spread policy and design solutions for cities and Planet Wild is funding those sorts of solutions in nature. It's just a good match. If you want to join a growing community that makes up a difference in nature, consider joining Planet Wild. You can give whatever amount, big or small, that feels right for you. Every dollar or euro or peso or whatever counts when protecting nature. And to get you started, I have a gift for you. The first 100 people to sign up using my code, BEAUTIFUL10, will get their first month paid for by me. Just scan this QR code or click on the link in the description. And the best part, you'll immediately have an impact in nature and see the results in less than 30 days here on YouTube. And there's no catch here, you can cancel any time. If you want to see Planet Wild in action, check out their project on Fungi right here.